Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you for joining us again. In this segment, we're going to be speaking with returning guest, Dr. Omar Sino. He's joining us here as U.S. Medical Lead, Rare Disease at UCB, to talk about some positive efficacy and safety results from two phase three studies evaluating a couple of compounds to treat GMG. Welcome back to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Sino. Thank you for joining us again. Hi, Neil. Thanks for having me. Nice to uh, speak with you again. Well, for those who aren't familiar with you as a contributor, give us a bit of your professional background. Talk briefly about your role at UCB, and then let's jump right into these uh, phase three studies, okay? Absolutely. So my name is Omar Sino. I am a physician by training. I've been with UCB since July 2020, and I am the U.S. Medical Strategy Lead for Rare Disease, and that covers neuromuscular disease specifically, MG, and our downstream neuroinflammatory uh, indications. So as U.S. Medical Strategy Lead, I'm responsible for getting us prepared for launch of both rosanalexizumab and Zalucoplan. I do a lot of engaging with our clinical development colleagues, um, our payer colleagues, and our commercial marketing colleagues when appropriate. Um, additionally, I work a lot with our advocacy, uh, my advocacy colleagues, to make sure that I'm understanding the lived experience of the patient, understanding their goals, limitations, and treatment, and making sure that from the medical side of things, we're addressing those needs. UCB is the only company that's currently investigating two potential treatments with multiple mechanisms of action in it, GMG. First of all, give our listeners a brief overview of GMG. What exactly is myasthenia gravis? Sure. So myasthenia gravis is a chronic autoimmune uh, condition that's really unpredictable in nature, and it's characterized by fluctuating episodes of muscle weakness. So specifically what happens is that pathogenic autoantibodies inhibit synaptic transmission at the neuromuscular junction because these autoantibodies damage the neuromuscular junction and they target specific proteins on what's called the postsynaptic membrane. And so this disrupts the ability of nerves to stimulate the muscle and results in a weaker contraction. And Myasthenia gravis can really occur at any age and in any race. Um, And there's really a bimodal distribution of age with um, individuals less than 50 years old being predominantly women and individuals over 60 years old being predominantly men. And in that range of 50 uh, years old to 60 years old, it's about equal male to female. What's the current treatment landscape look like? So there are a number of therapies for MG, and recently uh, there have been a few approvals for new, more specific medications in MG. But for a very long time, the standard of care has been broad-spectrum corticosteroids and non-steroidal ISTs. And those are medications that basically blunt uh, the immune response. And so while this is an autoimmune disease, these drugs limit that autoimmune response. The problem with these medications is that they're not always efficacious and they do cause a lot of serious uh, side effects for the patients. As a result of the limitations of these uh, non-steroidal IFTs and corticosteroids, there's this concept of the patients having to do trade-offs. And what I mean by that is sometimes because of the adverse events, of these medications, patients will choose to have uh, worse control of their symptoms because the side effects are so bad. So they could have increased weakness as a choice because their side effects uh, are so bad if you're going to reduce those uh, symptoms. I was actually talking to a mother who is a MG patient, and she was telling me about her two children. On Saturdays, one has hockey in the morning, The other one has soccer in the afternoon. And she has to make a choice which one of her kids she's going to be able to support that day because she doesn't have uh, the strength to do both. Mm -hmm. So this is why there's a lot of promise 
in these new, more specific therapies. Not only are they more efficacious, there are better side effects, or there are less side effects, and really we're hoping that those difficult choices that patients have to make are not going to be as common. Just how rare is MG, and what would you say is the biggest challenge, um, other than it being rare, to funding more research? So MG affects about 200,000 people worldwide uh, in the U.S., the EU, and Japan. In the U.S., there are around 36,000 to 60,000 patients with a prevalence of around 14 to 40 per 100,000. And with respect to development, um, there are, I think, the biggest challenge with development, and luckily uh, these days, there are more and more medications that are, like I said earlier, more specific uh, in nature, thus causing more efficacy and better side effects profile. But, you know, MG is a disease that affects every person differently. There's no two patients that are the same. And so creating and then using a medication in a standardized way is very difficult. Um, This is why sometimes the broad spectrum medications do work because they do blunt the overall autoimmune response. But at the same time, um, you know, that is not always efficacious, like I said, and sometimes comes with a lot of side effects. Another problem with drug development is that in the rare disease world, it's harder to get individuals into clinical trials sometimes. And this is because there are less patients, uh, but also, you know, sometimes the inclusion exclusion criteria can limit the individuals um, that can enter a trial. And this is not always for rare disease, or or I'm sorry, for myasthenia gravis, but rare disease uh, as a whole. One of the other things uh, that we've seen that makes development a little difficult is that not everybody knows about what's happening in their Uh, disease state, what's coming out in their disease state. This has been alleviated, luckily, by social media and support groups. Um, And I'm hoping that this thing is is sort of uh, obsolete now because of the number of new medications that are being evaluated in the field. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's going to be as big of an impact or an impediment to research and development as there was in the past. Omar, talk about the two compounds that uh, are in phase three development uh, currently uh, with UCB and how they differ from each other, if you would. So let's start with the Leucoplan first. The Leucoplan is a C5 inhibitor or a complement inhibitor. And this, the way that it works is that it inhibits complement-mediated damage at the neuromuscular junction by limiting the ability of the formation of what's called membrane attack complex. And the membrane attack complex is something that literally punches holes into uh, the muscle membrane, thus making it more difficult to uh, cause a contraction. Now, rosanolexizumab is an FCRN inhibitor. And FCRN is a pathway whereby autoantibodies, or I'm sorry, antibodies are recycled from the cell back into the the circulation. And under normal circumstances, this is very important. And what we would want to see, because we're increasing the half-life of antibodies. However, in myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disease, this FCRN recycling pathway increases the half-life of autoantibodies or bad antibodies, pathogenic autoantibodies. So by limiting or inhibiting the FCRN pathway, we are limiting the amount of pathogenic IgG antibodies that are around. Talk a bit about some of the results of the phase three trials. Sure. So for the Leucoplan, the, also known as the RAISE trial, it was a phase three uh, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study uh, looking at the efficacy and safety of uh, Zulucoplan in adult patients with GMG. And so the RAISE trial met the primary endpoint, which was the change from baseline and MGADL at week 12, as well as key secondary endpoints, which were 
the QMG score and the myasthenia gravis composite score, or QMG. And importantly, both, or all measures, I should say, were statistically significant and clinically meaningful. With my G, the primary endpoint was changed from baseline at day 43 in the MGADL, and this endpoint was met and cl clinically meaningful and statistically significant, as well as the secondary endpoints, both QMG and MGC, also being statistically significant and clinically meaningful. So for both Zalucoplan phase three and Rosanalexizumab phase three, we saw a clinically meaningful and statistically significant improvement in both the primary endpoint and the key secondary endpoint. If you would, could you give us a website where our listeners can learn more about this study and the compounds as well? So the website is www.ucb-usa.com. Always a pleasure, Omar. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Absolutely, Neil. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with returning guest, Dr. Omar Sino. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.